It is the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Management Cues webinar. Our topic for today is maximizing the ROI on management training. I'm Marisa Stolzfus, your HROD executive expert, bringing you more than 25 years of experience and your host for today's webinar. Now, training is often identified as a go-to solution to fix uh, the problem du jour. What is often missed, however, is the work required to determine if the training has taken root, changed behavior, and therefore closed the gap. It's not as simple as identifying a program and attending to it, and that's yet an entirely different topic uh, for what we will cover today, but it does connect. Today's session, however, will provide the formulas for identifying that elusive, hard ROI as a result of training. You'll also learn that there are steps required from both senior leaders and the managers attending the training to ensure that the learning can be measured to determine an ROI. So to walk us through this insightful webinar is CEO and founder of Management Cues. Dr. Myra Austin. Uh, Dr. Myra, take it away. Thank you so much. Yeah, so on point that introduction. Thank you, Marisa. So as she mentioned, um, you know, there's a partnership that has to occur. So at Management Cues, we really focus on creating training that is not only tailored to the client, but that syncs up in a, it syncs up in a very different way. We look at integrating both the client's disposition, the leadership's insights, what they're hurting uh, uh, through, and also the manager's own skills gaps and their way of engaging in the environment. So that's a little bit about management cues and how we do things slightly different. And so today's topic will touch on some of the things that we've learned along the way of what makes for a productive training opportunity with managers and what affords us the opportunity to have a much deeper, more intense discussion with leadership when needed. Um, what we have found through, through our framework and through our methodology at Management Cues is that oftentimes we have situations in which the manager needs support due to skills gaps, education gaps, experience gaps, which is all normal. Uh, but sometimes it's an environmental deficit that's taking place. Mm -hmm. And so having the appropriate training, that's what's going to render the ultimate return on investment. And so we'll break that down today. So with that said, just a little bit about us. So I'm Dr. Meyer Austin. I'm the CEO and founder of Management Cues. And I really am very passionate about management and operations. And so those are the two areas that I've been a connoisseur of for the past two decades. And like myself, Marisa has over two decades of experience at the executive level in the HR space. So she brings a wealth of knowledge in terms of partnership and organizational infrastructure and how to strategically approach these areas. So throughout our session today, please feel free to ask questions, put them in the chat. We will have a Q&A section at the end, but we want you to feel like you're part of this conversation because you are. You're, you're very relevant to, to what we're talking through today. Okay, with that said, let's get into the exciting part of today. So we are going to go through and introduce a little bit about the value behind management training and development. We will break down the ROI for you in qualitative and quantitative ways so that you leave understanding why it's so valuable and what to look for in your environment. We'll talk about the role of the executive in making decisions around management training um, and what areas to consider. And then we will talk about the manager and their role in participating and understanding what is happening when they're invested in when it comes to management training. OK, so these are a couple of areas that don't seldom get broken down this way or really discussed enough. And so you should leave with some really great insights uh, at the end of this session. We will close it out with a Q&A and closing remarks. And at that time, I will hand it right back to Marisa while you'll see us go back and forth and share our thoughts throughout the training. OK, all right, let's get to it. So management training and development. So these are some of the things we know 
about management training, and most people are aware of these areas, but training and management development is the process taken to improve the performance of individuals in management roles. So yes, the end objective is for everybody to be better. And I think fundamentally, we all understand that, but we don't ever slice that down to what it means to the individual or the organization. And that's where we miss an opportunity. It refers to educational activities, skill building, instruction, guidance, and mentorship. So it's not just receiving things in theory or in concept. It's taking it all the way through to where the person actually knows what to act on. And that's a common missed opportunity, in my opinion, too, is people may understand the definition of, of the concepts out there. They may not know how to realize them and put them into action. Uh, training and development should be embedded in the operational planning of an organization. Mm -hmm. So it should not be an afterthought. It should be something that's tailored in, that's a part of the culture and the environment that you're trying to create. Um, much like Marisa said at the beginning, it should not be a band-aid for a problem that you're having. Um, so if that's where you're starting um, in terms of the need for training, that's where you're going to start uh, missing the mark. It mitigates operational risk and downtime and keeps employers compliant and in good standing. So it really does safeguard the business when it's done correctly. And when you are in tune with why you're training, you're able to quickly connect the dots on what exactly you're mitigating. And so it guarantees succession resources are in place. Having managers ready to take the next step, that is securing the continuity of the business. And training and development is the only way that that happens. So that if somebody has to exit either um, optionally or, or through you know reasons of compliance or whatnot, you still have a resource in, that's next in line that's ready to go. And so the business cycles in, in a healthy way. Any thoughts on that, Marisa, before I jump on? Yeah, absolutely. It's important to note that training has to occur at some level, whether it's before or after. I used to tell my clients, do you want to pay now or do you want to pay later? Because either way, you're going to pay, right? So if you take this proactive approach to training and development and do the work that's necessary to realize that return on your investment it is a much better way of getting to your bottom line than trying to do the Band-Aid approach, as I mentioned earlier, and as Myra also mentioned. So, um, you know, that this is an important part of what, what needs to be done in a business. And so being proactive about it helps to mitigate the risk moving forward. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it is cheaper. But if you're not calculating, if you're not tracking, if you're not reconciling the How things you know? that we're... How do you know? Mm -hmm. You don't. Mm -hmm. You don't. It just feels expensive, right? It just feels like we're spending time in something that we're not comfortable um, spending time in. So we'll walk through why that is in a second. But there's a staggering reality in the workforce. And, and these statistics speak to why I decided to move forward with management cues and putting it together and the team that's behind this, this company. 59% of managers who oversee one or two employees report having no training at all. 59% of managers out there in the world that have people that they're responsible for, that have compliance that they're legally uh, responsible for, have never had training. It, it's it's such a negligent area. Um, as, a, as an operations leader, it makes me cringe to think of this. 41% of managers who oversee three to five employees claim the same. Right? So if, if the number increases, yet their development or training and investment in that doesn't. 50% of managers with over 10 years of experience claim they've only received about nine total hours of training over a 10-year period, right? 83% of businesses say it's important to develop leaders at all levels. Yes, we all know it's important, but are we making it part of the plan? And that's what the discussion really kind of encapsulates today is, are you making it part of your strategic angle, either as an individual manager who wants to succeed? And I'll say this, if you don't want to succeed in a management role, you probably shouldn't be in it. 
And if you want to succeed as a business, you have to make it part of the plan. So these are the tough decisions that we have to get really strategic around, right? So let's continue to explore this. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I'm I'm very partial to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. I did my doctorate thesis using their data and understanding the workplace. So in 2018, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics found that companies with fewer than 100 employees gave only 12 minutes of manager training every six months. And I can promise you it was probably something they had to do, right? Not something that was assessed that was curated, that was part of the plan. Probably it's speaking to probably like sexual harassment compliance or something that's mandatory versus something that's enriching. Organizations with 100 to 500 employees provided just six minutes, okay? And this came from an article that I read, which is the source is listed for you guys. And for anybody in attendance, you'll get the deck. The article was entitled, Are You Worth More Than Six to 12 Minutes of Training? So. I loved that title because one, it referenced data that I'm familiar with and I know is accurate, but two, are you? Do you feel right now in the seat that you're in as a manager or a leader that you're worth more than those six or 12 minutes? Because the answer should be 100% yes, yes. you're yes. worth it. For the work that you do and the teams that you lead, you are worth it, okay? So ROI becomes then that much more important. Um, okay, so why are managers and leaders missing this ROI component? Um, in every environment I've gone in so far in my career, I've been in disbelief in how little they know about the return that, they're, that they should be looking for in, in this process. So if managers are spending as little time as research suggests, the research we just looked at, then ROI is an afterthought. We don't even connect those dots when we're looking at training and development in the workplace. Management training and development isn't part of the operational strat strategy until systems or process or leaders fail. How to calculate the ROI in this area of business is seldom discussed, trained on, or clarified. Managers and leaders don't prioritize their own training or development and don't understand why it's directly related to their current situation, and I'll add, to their success or failure, mm. right? That's why you have managers who are in the same space for over 10 years and have never grown, have never navigated further, have never identified what's holding them back. A mind shift is required across organizations on how to strategically attain business sustainability, continuity, and a great culture. So in order to, you, we, we all want that. And I know that, right? We all want great culture. We all want to not have to fear for us to lose our job or for the company we work for to go down. But what does it take to get there is a better question right? What does it take to get there? Marisa, I'll pause and, and ask you for any insights. As an HR executive, you're in the middle of all of this when you're working with organizations. Yeah. So often I hear leaders say companies don't grow. People grow and take the company with them, right? If that's the case, we need to invest in our people. And part of investing it's critical to invest in managers so that they, number one, are compliant, reducing risk, but so that they're growing and being part of a succession plan. And succession plans are so often disregarded, right? Where you have one person who really knows how to do that job. And yeah. then if they, you know, if they leave, the knowledge goes with them. So, uh, yeah, this is just such an important part of running a business. And yes, we need to shift our mindset around development and training for our leaders. Right. And so if it's this strategic and it's this important, shouldn't it be that we don't feel like it's a chore, but like it's something that requires actual thinking through? And yes, investing absolutely. in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And too often, training is seen as something I have to do or something that gets a uh, low priority because the work has to get done. But if you don't go to training, you can't learn how to do the work better, faster, right? easier as an more operator. Efficiently. Yeah, more, more efficiently. efficiently. 
right? right? So the, it, the, it becomes this vicious circle. Yeah, the operator in me just can't, right? <laughs> I it really does. You can't do one without the other. And ultimately, um, for our managers and leaders out there, you want to do things as as easy as you can, not more, not with more, more effort doesn't necessarily mean more value. And wow. so that's where that mind shift changes. So this is my quote, so quote for me, uh, but understanding the importance and full benefit of training and developing managers starts with the end in mind. So start with the objective, right? Not with the feeling that it's a chore. The return on investment should be what is identified, explained, and structured out first. So there should be this template that you follow when you're thinking about training and development. It should be explained to managers and leaders to point to organizational and operational gaps. People should be clear on what it is that you're looking to attain and why it's so relevant to everybody's success. It should be intentional and a part of the plan, not a chore or something managers struggle to participate in. And so I'll speak a little bit more about that. But what I see commonly take place is managers are tired in training. They're burnt out. They're they're rushed out of training. They're checking their phones the whole time they're in training. Right. And it's because it hasn't been set up and introduced by leadership in a way where they understand the value and the importance of what is taking place. Right. And we play an active role in putting some design behind that. Okay, so now we're going to get into ROI, and then we're going to break it out into the executive disposition and the manager one. And ROI, if you just in case anybody on on the opposite and hasn't heard, you know, it's the return on investment. And so today we're talking about the return on investment in management training. And there are really two methods to look at this, um, uh, that you can look at this. You can quantify and qualify the return of what you're getting in training. And the first way is to calculate a very financial, right? Calculate monetary benefits and training costs. And we'll share the formula behind that. And then there's identifying and tracking the areas and the outcomes that are linked to the training. And so we'll talk a little bit about how to do that, what that looks like, but it's qualified, right? It's something that might be a little bit harder to quantify. Um, and so we'll talk about some methods behind that. So question before we move on to another slide. Oh, you already did. <laughs> Do we want to use both methods or one method or the other? Oh, great question. So optimally to me, I use a combination of both. And to me, it depends on the situation that's taking place in the company, what I'm looking to get out of the training, if I'm addressing an actual gap, which we will talk about, right? Because that gives you a disposition of authority with your CEO, with your board, with whoever is takes a part in deciding around the investment that you're making, this prepares you to have those conversations, but not just have the conversation to advocate for what is actually needed versus what people assume is needed or not. And those assumptions take place very often. I, I see, um, you know, the, the highest level of decision making assume something isn't needed because it's not affecting them. And the challenge there is that's a false narrative, but also nobody has broken it down for them in a way that they can digest it and where it's relevant to their role and what they need to make decisions around. So there's a fail on both ends when that yeah. happens. And I know people on the call have experienced that anytime they've asked for something that they have felt was needed, but maybe was rejected, right? So great question, Marisa. Thank you. So the ROI management training formula. So if you want to talk to your financial people and you want to come up with a, a, a formula that speaks to them, this is the formula. Right. And you obviously have to take a look at your monetary benefits, what comes out of these trainings and decide what that criteria is. And it could vary for each organization, depending on how you're doing it, who's involved, that kind of thing. And then your training costs, which would be all costs related to, to making that training happen. OK. And so then you go ahead and process it and we'll break down what the the answers or responses would mean um, in, in a semi-realistic scenario, right? Of course, your individual criteria is what would determine what's a good fit. And then you could use that formula once you've worked on it, moving forward for your organization. Um, any thoughts on, on that piece, Marisa? 
Yeah. So if you're doing an assessment, a training assessment, trying to do a formal assessment, determining what the needs really are across the organization, right, that's where you would uh, identify your criteria. If you're looking at training for someone in particular, uh, I'm guessing, Dr. Myra, that we would identify the criteria for that particular individual. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. No. And that's how it would work. So again, creating this templated way of looking at the the ROI financially is going to help you have a much more informed conversation with your CEO. And if there are particulars that you would include that your financial department would include in this calculation, that's great. Make them a part of the conversation. They know what ends up, um, you know, hitting the PNL and and how it sits. So those types of things are relevant. But you could start with giving it a try and having a discussion over it. Yeah, I would I would suggest one more point. Um, we you know we have a lot of compliance training, right? That we we have to do. So why not try and use this formula with compliance training and see how it plays out, right? Um, if you're looking at uh, harassment prevention, um, what is the bottom line return on investment given a criteria that might include? a decrease in complaints or no complaints, et cetera. So great formula to use for compliance, for sure. Yeah. And to get started, and that's a great example. And you could take a look at employee claims, any litigation fees, any outside counsel fees would be something that would be part of that equation, right? So great, great example. Good, tangible example. Thank you. Um, Okay, so applying the formula, right? So just ROI, right? When you're looking at ROI, you're just looking at net profit divided by total investment, right? Roughly. There's different types of ROI too, but I'm not the financial guru and I won't get into it. Uh, But when we're looking at training ROI, we're looking at a change in profits related to training divided by the cost of training. So that's really what that formula that I just showed you where it gets you. And um, I always like to break things down in a lay type of format uh, so that we have a fundamental understanding And so 100% return on your investment means you've earned the investment back, right? If your ROI is less than 100%, then you've lost on that investment, right? And then anything over 100 means you've made money from that training investment. So keeping track of these things and tying it to criteria that's related to the topic that you're training on, for example, right? That helps you understand why it's so valuable and and kind of points to the bottom line impact uh, directly and indirectly, depending on what you what criteria you've included. But that's a much more specific and focused conversation than saying they went out there and they didn't even learn anything, right? Which is kind of what I see happen is uh, comments like that or comments like we don't know what they learned and what they're applying. Well, nobody's reinforcing it and nobody's following through on it. And there's no system for that. And there's no process for that. And so that that's an assumption that we walk away and make decisions around, which then in turn, to me, it becomes very negligent, right? Okay. Okay, so average ROI. So this is just industry knowledge, just so that you are all aware of not, it's not about perfection. It's about getting to know your environment and what works for your organization from a training and development standpoint and what doesn't. So average ROI can vary widely. Okay, so just know there's a lot of training and different types of approaches out there. Um, It's about understanding your environment, um, your ecosystem, as I like to call it, right? Training ROI can vary by industry. Okay, so what happens in one industry from a training and development standpoint or benefit can be different for yours. Training ROI can vary by training initiatives. Uh, Maurice's example is just a good one because everybody can relate to it. But you Mm -hmm. can have a harassment and discrimination training, and then you can have an effective management training, right? These are different training initiatives that should render different outcomes. And so it's important to understand those areas, too. Yeah, another good example is performance management. Um, Most all companies do some level of performance management, and they train their managers on how to do effective performance management, or they should. Uh, And so um, that's another easy, not maybe not easy, but common uh, uh, training that you can use as a prototype to determine the average return on investment. 
Yeah, and I'll say this, when it comes to performance management, as an example, your key performance indicators should speak directly to it. So that's the criteria that you would include in the calculations for a performance management training, right? There should be some increases after that training. Okay, so tracking ROI qualitatively. So this is looking at the softer part of the return and kind of the human component, if that's the way I feel about it at the very least. Um, but you're identifying outcomes of employee training before training takes place. So you're talking with your management team, your leadership team, and you're saying, what do we want to achieve through this training? Right. And it could be addressed. It could be addressing some challenges. It should also be addressing individual strengths and weaknesses, experience gaps, knowledge gaps. Um, you know, if there's a deficit that's taking place with one of your KPIs, that's a red flag. That's a specific, you know, constraint for the business. You should be talking about that before you're rolling out the training so that you know what to expect as a return. Right. And that's qualitative discussion. You want to place a monetary value on the outcome. So like the performance training we talked about, if there are key performance indicators, they should directly speak to that training. There should be a benefit of increasing those KPIs. And there's most definitely a dollar value attached to that if you talk to your financials, uh, financial department or your lead operator. You want to isolate the effects of employee training per participant and as a management team. So as a management team has a difference taken place post-training individually, you want this is something that is great to delegate to the person that they re, that they re, um, respond to or they direct uh, are directed by. Ask them if they see any individual differences in the performance or behavior of the person who participated in the training. And then you want to compare pre and post training results. If there's a shift, what was the shift? You know, uh, track again, behavior is so important, but if there was an awareness, a growth, uh, that's visible, a uh, maturity change, right? Self awareness are, are, are examples of behavior that changes if, if there's effective training taking place and if the training is in line with what the participants need. Um, any comments on the qualitative piece, Marisa? Yeah, I, Dr. Myra, you often talk about the management team as a team rather than working in silos and working within their functional area. Um, and you can you can assess whether or not the team uh, and the team itself can assess themselves as a team yeah. to determine whether or not training has shifted behavior or has closed a gap or has uh, improved performance. So yeah. um, it's, I think it's a really important point to make because management teams don't normally work as a team. They, they yeah. work individually. So um, just a point that came up for me as you were going through uh, your, your uh, five points. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that operationally for me, it's significant for managers to see themselves as a management team, as a unit. And the reason for it is because they're leading the organization, they're facilitating, they're executing. And so if they're not aligned, if there's not that level of trust and team pride, you lose that. And then that's when you have fragmentation. So if you're curious about how to measure the outcome of training from a team perspective, I'll say this, typically what I look for is, is, in, is coordination improved, is communication improved, right? Um, is, you know, have, have uh, employee claims around disconnects in the department, have those decreased? These are the things that I look for when I know that the team is starting to form an identity in which they're working together and not against each other. Um, because when you're working in silos, you see yourself as a manager leading a department, and that's all that you see. When you see yourself as a unit, you won't let another manager fail because you know that they're part of the big picture just like you are. So it's yep. this shift in mentality. Yeah, great, great point there. Thank you. So these are some qualitative ways to measure ROI on training. Um, surveys, ratings, reviews, application trackers. And by application trackers, what I mean is what have they applied from the training? Um, and 
asking that question and tracking it um, as you're, you know, uh, measuring your investment in training and development. One-on-one -on -one feedback is always wonderful. Uh, giving somebody an opportunity to say, I hated this. I love this. Here's what I learned. Here's what I changed. And if they're not open, those are the questions you should ask. What did you learn? What did you change? What did you love? What did you hate? Right. And that gives you a qualitative uh, way of measuring that. And then performance tracking, linking back to what you already track, uh, depending on the topic, should have an impact on, on that performance tracking. Um, I know that this is a passionate area of yours, Marisa. Is there anything you'd yeah. like to add? Yep, the boss by which all bosses are evaluated uh, used to send me to training. And when I'd come back, he'd say to me, okay, now how do you apply this to your staff, right? And he would, uh, you know, just ask me about not just what I've learned, but how would I apply it to the team that I was managing, right? And that makes you think about what, you know, it makes you take a deeper dive into the time that you just spent uh, uh, in a classroom. Um, and it really does, that, that helps to sustain what it is you've learned. So, um, and that for me is the one-on-one -on -one feedback, the performance tracking, it's all, the application tracker, it's all connected uh, yeah. and it works together. Yeah, and and hearing your, your, your um, experience, the word that comes to mind for me is reflection. Mm -hmm. Are we reflecting on what we're doing? Because how else do you really continue to gain self-awareness through this process? And so as leaders, if we're not asking and we're, we're not taking this qualitative approach, we're also going to miss out um, on a portion of that return on investment that just won't show up on a PL. So that's why I do a combination depending on what the need is. Uh, most of the time, I, I understand what I want to get from it and I can tie it back pretty quickly. Um, but when you don't, it you have to reflect on it, right? So we're going to break it down. We're going to break it down now. It's going to get very personal for our executives out there. And we're going to do the same thing for our managers. And just to let you know, the reason I combine these um, is because you have to see both sides of the, of the coin to get that full understanding of return on of investment. If not, you lose in partnership. And this is a partnership type of deal to get the most out of it. Okay. So that was the logic behind combining these and not making them separate separate sessions. So the role of executive leadership in management training initiatives. So as an executive leader, this is what you should be doing uh, to really not only invest wisely, but know how to link back your return on investment. And it's assess the organization at the management level. You have to know what gaps are there in order to be able to support them. Ensure that training ne uh, needs align with the company goals. You cannot have organizational objectives intend on achieving them and not know what's missing in that puzzle, right? It just, it doesn't make any sense. Survey the management team to understand their training disposition. Find out how they feel about training. Have they never had training? Because that should tell you exactly where your people are at. Have they had training, but it's been a negative experience? They're going to have some feelings around that, maybe scared, maybe intimidated. Uh, and so they're not going to uh, take in the training as easily. These things impact your investment. Training initiatives and content should encapsulate mission, vision, and core values. Everything should tie back to who you want to be and why you want to be that as a company. Set clear expectations on training outcomes with management and leadership teams, and it's both. It's the people in training and the people outside of that training that are supporting these people, because otherwise you're going to have a break in outcome, and, and you're not going to see what they've learned realized, and maybe it's your leadership getting in the way, right? Ensure training is relevant and engaging. People learn more when they enjoy what they're doing, and that just is. As human beings, we could talk about neuroscience all day long. And if you want to check out some of our stuff, you can hit up our YouTube channel. Uh, but we we touch on neuroscience because it's embedded throughout our training. Our approach is meant to stimulate people in the training environment. Plan for post-training support to reinforce what has been learned. Have a plan. What are you going to do with what you've learned and what they've learned from their training experience? Challenge your company leaders to embrace continuous learning. It can't be an afterthought. 
It can't be punishment either. That's just, that really kills the whole learning culture that you're, you're promoting maybe, uh, but aren't necessarily realizing. Allocate a consistent budget to training and development efforts. Even if it's small, it's more important to have consistent training throughout the year, If it, even if it's 30 minutes monthly, whatever it is. Um, and we have some stats around that too, but it's more important to be consistent than have one large training event. That could be probably the biggest waste of money, right, is to do something like that. And so from an executive leadership perspective, these things have to be in line with the investment that you're looking to make. Uh, Marisa, anything from you? Well, too often, the executive leaders believe that they've done their part because they've identified the training and the company's paying for it. But the the involvement needs to be deeper than that. The involvement, you know, the executive leaders will learn through this process as well, right? They're going to learn from their managers and their managers are going to learn from them. Uh, so it's really important that the executive leaders engage, um, create opportunities to talk about what's being learned, how it's being applied, uh, and uh, what else needs to happen in order to raise the bar. Because that's the bottom line. We're, we just want to raise the bar and on yeah. performance. Yeah. And just keep in mind, if your budget is tiny and almost non-exist non-existent, that's okay. I've been in that position. You could still do it. It's about consistency and your level of engagement, right? So it doesn't have to be a massive overhaul of anything. It really just has to be intentional. So why isn't management training prioritized in the workforce. So the statistics speak to it and they and there's all kinds of reports out there that speak to it. So it definitely is relevant even today uh, with all of the amazing training tools that we have in the world still today, very relevant. The executive leadership team fails to prioritize training and development or places minimal emphasis on skill development. The executive leadership team has not received consistent training or development themselves. Sometimes you get to leadership because you're a phenomenal individual contributor or you're brilliant or you had a great opportunity and you took advantage of it. Whatever the situation is, the responsibility doesn't end there. Right. And so sometimes we need some some uh, assistance in understanding training and development for others, even if we ourselves don't need that specific type of development. There is a disconnect between execution, strategy, and culture. So in order to execute, people have to be ready. Right. And this is me speaking in very lay operational terms. Right. Um, if they're not ready, they cannot fulfill that vision. And, and so that's what you're looking at with training and development is, are they ready? And if you're not sure, start there by identifying who's ready for what. There is a poor tracking on training impact and return on investment. So again, return on investment becomes an afterthought and we don't track it. We don't measure it. We don't understand it. It's not even part of the conversation. The company does not have a strong strategy for succession planning or business continuity. We respond to people as they leave, which means panic, chaos, and probably a shortage in skill set at the appropriate levels. That's, that's the pattern that takes place when this happens. So if you're living through that, it's probably because of this. The management and executive leadership don't know how to identify the skills and talent gaps in the environment. And, and there's a method to this, right? Assessments, management assessments, skills gaps across the organization. There's different tools from an HR perspective that you can use to identify these things. You don't have to do it by yourself, but you do have to take an initiative to get it done. And then training and development is, is considered non-productive time. So it's considered separate from work, mm. separate from the organizational goals, um, which is interesting because you can't get any of those done well, fast or better without this piece, right? So it should be part of the equation. The company does not have a strong HR leader and uh, to facilitate the processes or, or educate or provide training around these higher level strategies. And so, um, you know, the one of the most experienced HR leaders I've ever have partnered with is Marisa on this call, along with others. Marisa, what would you say when, when you look at this slide? Is it reflective of what you've seen? Oh, my goodness, yes. And there are so many connections to other HR processes. For example, succession planning. 
right? If we're not developing our people, we're not preparing for the future. And that's what succession planning is all about. It's preparing for the future. Um, companies, that, you know, HR leaders um, sometimes get a bad rap, uh, but HR leaders need to be strong. They need to have a strong voice in this piece that we call strategy. And it is shifting in the work environment. HR leaders are having more of a say at the table with the executive leaders, but there's still, there's, we could be, we could do better. We could do better yeah. as a company. We can do better as HR leaders. Yeah. So, um, and, and the, the, the identifying skills and talent gaps, one of the best tools that HR has that we don't really use are job descriptions. Do they have competencies identified? If you have those competencies, that's the assessment tool that you use to determine whether or not you have the skills or if you have talent gaps. And from there, you you take that information uh, and do some of the other things that Myra has suggested, bring it all together. Your analysis helps you to determine what training is needed, who needs it, and how quickly it needs to be done. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and we have seen HR partnership grow, and they absolutely have a place at the decision table anytime I'm partnering with them because they play a critical role in facilitation. And so in not understanding that we're missing that facilitation piece and typically it'll it'll take us to a point of failure. So when to invest. So as a leader who's making decisions around training and development, when it when should you be more concerned about investing and there are triggers in the environment that point to the need, the sense of urgency around it, right? If you have a cadence, you won't have these urgencies come up, but if you don't have a cadence right now, you wanna pay attention to these special areas because uh, trouble, risk, and other costs are gonna stem from it if you don't put training and development in place. And so these things are when new management behavior is desired, when your management team is not working the way that they should together, or their outcomes are not what the company needs, they need training. When new systems, processes, or procedures, or software are introduced, managers need training because they're executing, they're directing, they're facilitating at their level, so they need to know these things inside and out for the company to succeed. When the company is undergoing change, if you have a massive change in leadership or structure, the managers need to or be process. reinforced or processed. Or process. They need to be... Um, very confident in that undertaking for it to be successful and not create problems down the line. When there is a shortage of managers or leaders, if you didn't work on succession planning, you didn't make training and development a priority, you're going to have to train people to step into management and leadership roles prior to promoting them and prior to maybe hiring them if you're hiring them from the outside. Um, when strategic priorities require it, you have a big strategic move for operational excellence. You better train your people to know how to be excellent. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that even mean? Right. Mm -hmm. There has to be a step by step process to get there. Excellence doesn't just happen. Mastery doesn't just happen. When the company is scaling, if you're growing, you need to reevaluate what different uh, legal, for, for one, legal areas apply to you now that you've grown. And from a management perspective, have the managers ever managed a group more than five people, right? Things like that is what you have to look at. When there is a wave of legacy team members exiting that company, that happens all the time. People age out all the time. When that happens, it changes everything for, for team members and for managers because they had resources who knew what they were doing that they relied upon. They're no longer there. And these legacy team members are leaving with their knowledge, with their experience. So training is needed at that point. When operational efficiency is lacking, if operations are weak, you need to train your people to help you reinforce operations and get it to where you need it to be. When there is an increase in legal and employee claims, if HR is receiving a ton of claims and there's a trend, you need to train. That's the response, right? Preventative is better. But if mm -hmm. you're at the point where you're not training and there's a cluster of employee complaints, um, you know, that's the time you have to address it. When there is a large percentage of employees, new employees in the company, and for me, large percentage is typically 25%, depending on the size of the business that you're in, but you have 25% new 
right? Or close to that amount. You have to, you have to reset. You have to train people on the norms of the business and your expectations. Um, when M&As uh, take place, you have mergers and acquisitions. Everything is changing. Training and development is needed for that transition to be successful. Any thoughts on that one, Marisa? Awesome slide, Dr. Myra. Keep it going. All right. Okay. And I know we uh, are going to have to speed it up here, but resourceful ways to support management and training development. So what do you do to support people to be successful, particularly managers when it comes to training? You want to identify the training and development areas you want to focus on. You want to plan for a continuous budget allocation for training and development, even if the budget is small. As mentioned before, consistency is key. Hire an HR leader that incorporates development and succession planning into their strategy and the pillars in day-to-day -day operations. Make sure that the HR leader connects all those dots, even mm. if you're only touching them, but that you're aware that those need to be touched. That's the, the key, right? Identify state and federal required training for your company and schedule it on a recurring basis. So in California, we have requirements we have to meet. So those should be on calendar no matter what but make sure that they are, and then you build on top of that. Invest in a communication vehicle or process where management training heads can be captured and voiced, right? So a place where people can talk about training and development. You don't have to do, um, you know, have massive plans with the feedback that you get, but you do need to hear from them. Don't promote managers without providing them with introductory management training first. That's going to be your first risk mitigator. Um, get them through an introductory training in management before that happens. Ensure management job descriptions include a training and development expectation or requirement. This is not a special ask. With the role that they play, they have to be prepared to train and develop and nurture relationships in the workplace. Okay, why you should invest in management and uh, training and development. Uh, Well-trained managers are respected. They boost morale. Uh, there's improved morale and productivity and retention when this happens. Knowledgeable managers mitigate legal risk. Train mm -hmm. managers elevate the brand and, and they elevate the way that they interact with each other in internal and external relationships. Train managers provide your environment with a threshold and a benchmark for performance. They're able to set the example and so people know what threshold to rise to, right? Otherwise, everybody's in the murky water and everybody's lukewarm because that's the standard that's been set. Train managers are more engaged managers. Train managers build skills within their teams and operational excellence is only achieved through well-trained managers. There is no, no coincidence there. Yeah, one yeah. point I'd like to make uh, in, on that slide, whether you're a manager or senior leader, people are watching you. The people that report to you, the people that, that don't report to you, they watch you. And so the example that you set is critical and the best example that you can provide provide is one that is well developed. Absolutely. And so when you're thinking about training and development, for those of you that are numbers folks, right? You want to know exactly what a healthy amount of, of a time allocation looks like. This is just a starting point and it could vary, but it's to give you a sense of awareness around this. Research suggests that managers should spend at minimum 5% of their time training and learning in their roles to be fully maximized and successful. So I challenge the folks out there, right? Think about how much time you allocate and if it matches this, this expectation. This would be around 100 hours per year which is approximately the equivalent of two hours per week, right? So you can do all kinds of calculations around this, and it doesn't have to be this, but this is what research suggests. So if your calculation right now is at zero, I suggest to increase it slightly and move forward from there, right? It doesn't have to be this, but it's if you're doing zero, right? If you're doing zero, you're not winning. It, you know, that's not what winning would look like. So let's break it down from the management side now, okay? So when should managers seek training and development? So this is a prompt. When should managers take the cue to actually request training and stand in that area of 
I deserve training, right? You deserve more than six to 12 minutes, like we said at the beginning. Here's when you should be triggered, right, as a manager. When you've never managed a team before, you should request training. When you've never occupied a management role, request training. When you come across a situation you're not familiar with, request training. When you're not familiar with employment law, request training. When there are legislative changes that are taking place in employment law, particularly in California, we're super litigious, request training. When a new or updated employee handbook has been published, request training. So these key things that happen require a higher responsibility of you managers. Don't just take it blindly. Because and train, if it, yeah. go ahead. And, and training comes in many different forms, right? It could be a newsletter that you read from a legal entity. It could be a book that you read. It could be uh, a classroom instruction. It could be a video that you watch. It could, it could be a number of different things, but do something. Do something about it and step into it and start with your employer because you're serving them and you're both absorbing risk. And that's true. And so these are the things we need to talk about, you know, as a manager, you need to step into this and know that this is a part of the expectation. Prioritize your, your in-training experience. How you show up in training shows your level of self-awareness and your commitment to success in your role. That's always been true. And I remember being young and learning this from my mentors and understanding that just like Marisa said, we were always being watched and it's not in this micromanaging sort of watched it's right. it, it's being watched in terms of the potential that we have and whether we are respectful of the investment being made right whether we can connect those dots and yeah. so employee development begins with managers the employees are going to get better because you're better and that's how that works that's how that relationship works prioritizing your own management training experience is a strategic decision it's not a chore. And if you're smart, you're strategic about it. And you take as much training as somebody is willing to pay for, right? Because it's invested in you and nobody could take it from you, right? Somebody could take the job, but nobody can take what you bring to the table, okay? And so we compromise that when we belittle the experience. So just be careful with those thoughts of, I'm too busy to do this. You're too busy to be better because that's what you're saying, right? You're better than that. Taking full advantage of the investment being made is reflective of self-awareness. Coming to training prepared is a demonstration of commitment to your own success. We should work harder for ourselves than we do anybody else, right? And trust me, I'm very respectful of all of our employers and all the partnerships, but you have to care about you first to give the most that you can give. Your own growth and development should take priority in your management journey if your plan is to succeed. So just decide, do you want to succeed? Because if you want to succeed, it's path A, not path B, right? If there are barriers and challenges getting in the way of your training, it should be communicated with leadership. You should talk through it. I can't get to training because I'm, I'm very burnt out. I have too many projects. I can't focus on my growth. I need help with that. It's okay to say that. It's important for you to succeed. No employer at the end of the day wants their managers that they're paying for to fail. But sometimes mm. they don't know what failure looks like or where it starts. Okay, so remember that. Okay, training performance expectations. So this is what it looks like to perform within a training experience. Um, you're managing your attendance and punctuality. You're ensuring that you're prepared. You're actively participating and actively participating means asking questions, sharing comments, identifying challenges. It means taking notes, making eye contact, staying focused, following up and following through. It means connecting to build a management community, right? It means build your network of professionals and resources that you can ask questions and opinions of in a professional setting. That the performance and behavioral examples. How you show up in your in your training experience is how your team members are going to show up in yours when you train, when you facilitate, when you direct. Okay. 
Okay, so here are some interesting, interesting facts. And I know we're running short on time. So if you could stay on, please do. We shouldn't be too much longer. But interesting in training uh, and developing statistics. So 93% of employees said that well, well planned tr employee training programs positively affect their level of engagement. 68% of employees say training and development is the company's most important policy. So if you don't have a policy around training and development, that's your cue leaders uh, out there, right? That's something you need to add. 60% of workers embarked upon their own skills training last year, highlighting an unmet appetite in the workforce for greater knowledge, right? Employers are missing an opportunity to retain when they don't have a plan for training and development if there's an appetite for it in the workforce. Gen Z is more inclined to watch training material, consuming 50% more learning material in comparison to other generations in 2020. Okay, we have to know our audiences and how they like to learn. 57% of employees also now expect to learn in a just-in-time way, right? Where they're self-paced, they're learning where they, when they can, but the employer is making it clear on how that can happen and what opportunities they have. So if you haven't defined those areas, you should. People are 95% more likely to retain information when conveyed via video than via text alone, right? So that interaction is important. So have a mix of interaction with your training programs and what you decide to invest in. Pulse surveys, which is one of Maurice's favorite tools, are the most effective way to understand employee reception as they enjoy a response rate that's 45 to 55 percent higher than traditional surveys. So if you're not familiar with pulse surveys, start there. Uh, but in really quickly, they're topic based, they're short. They're meant to just get information around that that subject area. 90% acknowledge high quality data is integral to improvement learning delivery in, in their organization. People are smarter, more knowledgeable, and have more information at their disposal than any time in the past. Okay, we're in a different game here. And so the training experience matters, how you deliver education that matters, and it's going to impact your environment one way or the other. So quantifying ROI through neuroscience. So as we've mentioned, a management cues is unique. We, we train, we challenge in our training in a very different way. We incorporate uh, neuroscience. Uh, we actually partner with a company called Neuron who does studies uh, who are objective, third-party, non-biased to show us how our training actually impacts people from a neuroscientific standpoint. And so here's what we know. Neuroscience shows us that what can be achieved through management training is a deep impact, right, on team members. If the managers are impacted through a positive training experience, they're going to go on and, and manifest that in the environment. How managers interact with team members and their leaders has lasting physiological effects. We're impacting people in more ways than one. And so we need to be aware of that as we're communicating, as we're determining what programs we want for them to participate in. From a neuroscience perspective, the rational brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, and the manager's limbic systems are triggered in adverse ways when they are not properly trained and the approach is a negative one, right? So it's important to to understand the impact we're having on people. When we encourage team members through reinforcement and recognition, we create neural pathways in relation to performance. So taking these steps have a positive lasting impact in the person's being. I can't think of anything more powerful than that. Managers must look deeper than the outcomes and focus on experience to really maximize an employee's productivity in the new age, okay? How we represent, how we show up, how we make people feel, it's relevant. It's relevant to productivity and operations. So these are our key takeaways. Management training and development. Managers don't receive enough training and development according to research. And you could look at it in all kinds of ways and the research all points to the same. We're not doing this enough and we're not doing it well. Executive leadership involvement. The involvement in planning around training and development for managers requires executive leadership to understand their role in the ROI. Managers must prioritize their own success. Managers who prioritize their success will prioritize training and development opportunities in their role. 
Those are the managers you want to invest and retain in, in an organization. Training initiatives. There should be leadership awareness and involvement around training and development taking place in an organization for there to be purpose and intent behind the investment. And I see the chat bubble. I'll be right with you. Return on investment. There are two methods you can use to calculate or document your ROI. Okay, so these are the takeaways for this uh, session. And let me go ahead and check the chat. Okay, yes, thank you, ladies. Have to jump off. Yes, thank you so much for joining. And Marisa, I will hand it over to you. Yeah, so in closing, as we conclude today's session, I encourage you to apply what you've learned. It may not be easy the first time around. However, in taking time to address the pre-training steps, you'll be able to calculate the value of training and development. The recording of this webinar and the deck will be emailed to all participants. Uh, and we invite you to stay involved and join us on site for our next topic, Mastering Team Member Accountability, which is scheduled for later this month on Saturday, April 27th at the Fullerton Community Center here in SoCal. Additional resources, such as the Popular Management Planner and other tools to support your ongoing development can be found on the website at managementcues.org. Connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube to stay updated on upcoming events, to submit your questions, or to simply share some feedback with us. Thank you for being part of today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you.